Well, this is going to be a little bit, a little bit different this morning. We're both going to be speaking, hopefully not together, you know. And what makes it also a little <coughs> bit different is, um, I think we're going to be nice to one another for a change on this platform. How about really? we do that in 2019? <laughs> I, I can't believe that. I want to wait and see. Yeah. Come on. We can do it. <laughs> okay, so, so that means I can't uh, call you a, a, a skinny, apple-eating ginger with strange eyebrows. <laughs> so I can't? All right, and in that case, I'll say nothing about your age and that shiny head of yours. How's that? Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so funny. Some people, some people think that we may, we probably are enemies. But meanwhile, contrary to popular belief, I actually get along well with this guy. We play tennis twice a week, and, uh, and we regularly bride together. At least once a year. <laughs> you see what I have to put up with. But I still think we make a great team. Like pop and voss, chicken mayonnaise, we make a good team. I think he's the pup. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So, um, considering we are speaking together, would you just tell me what we're speaking on so I can just quickly prepare? <laughs> it's a bit late now, wouldn't you say? <laughs> well, there's, there's this line that, by the way, we are going to be unpacking this morning. Okay, great. Not me unpacking, you comment. We're All both right. going to be doing it. So there's this great line that, that I think going into the new year, ending off this old year, going into the new year, it's a great line for us to, to just have a look at, just to unpack a little bit. We're going to try and do that. And, um, and I think it can be a, a great blessing going into this new year. And who wouldn't want to have a blessed 2020? So what's the line? So what's the line? All right. To increase your peace today, you've got to resolve your yesterdays. You've got to prepare for your tomorrows. And I say that again. To increase your peace today, you've got to look back. You've got to resolve some stuff from yesterday. And you've got to look forward. And you've got to prepare for, for tomorrow. Great line, great line. And I know whenever it comes to your preaching, you're always looking for the how, you're lo always looking for the practical. Leonard will always say, Leonard, what do you want them to do? He regularly speaks to himself, by the way. I thought I'd just throw that in there. So I know, without a fact, you're going to say, all right, how do they resolve yesterday's? How do you prepare for tomorrow? So practical, do do practical. We always want it to be practical. And I think there are quite a number of practical steps that we can take. But what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at three basic steps to resolve our yesterdays and three very simple basic steps to prepare for our tomorrows. And as we normally do here at Maranatha, we'll say to you, pick one. Mm. Don't try and apply all six because you probably find you're doing okay and three, four, five of them, but there's one that you just know that one stands out. So, so pick one, wait for it, and and we'll unpack it a little bit. We're just going to touch on them. And then, and you know, that's, that's your one. And what we're going to do is, I'm going to give you all six up front. So you know exactly where we're going. So, let's have them on the screen quickly. To uh, resolve your yesterdays, you've got to seek reconciliation. You've got to evaluate the failures. We all have. Forgive self. Sometimes that's difficult. And then what about tomorrows? Preparing for tomorrow. If we're going to prepare for tomorrow, money always plays a role in our lives. We've got a budget. We've got to prioritize family. I think there's nothing more important than the people in our lives. Prioritize family. And then in closing, we're just going to look at considering eternity. So those are the, th the six things. So let's jump into the first one, seeking reconciliation. So Robinson Crusoe is finally being rescued. A ship has arrived, captain, and a captain jumps off the ship, lands on the beach. Here's this man who's been alone for some 20 odd years, super excited. But the captain notices three beautiful buildings in front of him built on the beach. He's quite intrigued by this. So he says to Robinson Crusoe, pointing to the first one, like, what's this building? So Robinson Crusoe is quite proud, and that's, that's my house, that's my home, that's what I built. It's like, wow, that's, that's impressive. And then points to the second building and says, well, what's that building? Robinson Crusoe, that's a church. It's a church. The captain's like, wow. Then he looks at the third one and says, what about that one? Robinson Crusoe says, 
That's also a church. I got upset with the first one and I left. <laughs> you want to have greater peace today, reconcile what happened yesterday. Let's have a look at God's word here. In Romans 12, 18, God gives us clear instruction. Do all you can to live in peace with mm. everyone. Let's hear Jesus' words from Matthew. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So I remember reading this line that says, whenever there is motion, there is some kind of friction. Yeah. Friction means there's motion. If there's no friction, that means you're going nowhere. That relationship perhaps is not going anywhere. The department mm. is lifeless. And you're saying, my oh, goodness, isn't that a bit of a negative statement? No, it's a reality of life. We're all different. We do things differently. We see things differently. We like or dislike different things. That means that it results in a bit of friction. And I think we need to highlight, we're not talking about a permanent war zone here. That's mm. dysfunctional. That's for a different topic. We're talking about the fact that when you're living together, doing life together, working together, somewhere, somehow, you rub one another up the wrong way. And Jesus, God gives us a clear responsibility right in our laps. And here it is. Seek reconciliation. Take a white flag not a red flag. Take an olive branch, not an olive stick. Take a milk tat, take some biltong, take some chocolates, go knock on that door. And as we're even unpacking this point, there's a person right now that maybe is coming to mind, a, an argument that wasn't resolved or disagreement that was left pear-shaped. Seek reconciliation. God gives us 100% responsibility. Yeah. Greater peace today, resolve it yesterday. Seek reconciliation. But I think what I need to highlight is that we have 100% responsibility. That doesn't mean that there's 100% success. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you're knocking on that door and they close that door in front of your face. Or they take the milk tat and then close the door in front of your face. <laughs> but guess what? Yeah. That still results in greater peace for you. You know mm. why? Because mm. you put your head on a pillow at night and it's like, God, I tried. And it's almost as if you have this peace straight from God where God is saying, I know, that's all I asked you to do. Mm. Forgive those who hurt you yesterday. Life is too short yeah. not to, and it's going to kick off your 2020 in a great way. Yeah. So that's the first one. All right, seek reconciliation. So we want greater peace today. We've got to resolve our, our yesterdays, and we do that by seeking reconciliation. Here's the second one. We evaluate failure, and I think this is a big one. I think this is a very important one. Why? Because we've all failed, and, and we fail. We do crazy things. That's just that's what happens. It's, it's the human side, and, and so often... We wish we could go back and we could go and rewind the clock. We could have a redo or, as they say in golf, a mulligan, not that you and I play golf at all. No, it's a sport from hell. I think a lot of, a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Exactly. It's a terrible. We'll stick to tennis. So I think it's better. <laughs> all right. Now, life doesn't give us a replay. It doesn't give us a mulligan. But what it does give us is the opportunity to learn from our mistakes. But I remember you handled this as a, as a topic once, and you, you highlighted to us that it's not failure that's the teacher. It's when we evaluate. Yeah. Otherwise, you just keep going around yeah. that same bush. That's exhausting. That's not peaceful. Yeah. So we don't, we don't necessarily learn from failure unless we evaluate the failure. The key is to evaluate. What does that mean? It means that we actually stop for a moment and look back at the failure. Because you see, sometimes we want to ignore the past, ignore the failure, pretend it didn't happen, and just, just carry on. And, and we're just kind of friendly with one another, and we just try and l let it be. But you see, if we're going to learn, if we're going to, if we, uh, we're going to grow from that thing, we've got to stop, and we've got to look back, and we've got to evaluate the failure. And, and here's the thing I want you to see, is that we've got to take responsibility. Take responsibility. Now, that means you put up your hand and you say, I failed. Mm. I blew it. I shouldn't have done that. 
I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Well, that's called taking responsibility. Now, it's crazy how we think avoiding responsibility, just pretending it didn't happen, just continuing today as if nothing happened. We think ah, that's going to give us greater peace, but it doesn't. It doesn't. It's the opposite. It's when we pause and we take responsibility. We put up our hand and we say, you know what? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. The moment we do that, there's a weight that just drops off our shoulders. And what's that called? Ah, peace. We suddenly have peace. And I remember a line from that particular message from Benjamin Franklin, which I thought was so good. Let's have it on the screen. He that is good for making excuses and is seldom good for anything else. I think it's a great line. Because you see, it's easy for you and me to look back at our past and to make excuses. Yeah, but don't go there. Put up your hand and say, I blew it. I'm sorry. Now, once you've done that, here's the next step. Learn, look back and see what can I learn from that mistake. So in other words, what would I do differently in hindsight? What can I do today to make sure that it's not going to happen again? Or what, what do I need to start doing? Or what do I need to stop doing? And so what am I doing there? I'm, I'm learning. I'm not just, I'm not just, I haven't just made a mistake and I just carry on, but I've learned from that. You see, unless, unless we do that, unless we learn from it, it's going to happen again and again and again. And so looking back, taking responsibility, those two things, taking responsibility and learning from it prevents us from going forward and doing it again. And so maybe you find yourself today where you're sitting here and you're saying, you know, Leonard, I, I did some crazy stuff this past year, some really stupid stuff. Or get, get, can, can I put it another way? Some human stuff. Because mm. <laughs> we're human. Yeah. And we all fail. Failure is not the problem. It's learning from the failure. How do we do that? We look back. We, we evaluate the failure. We take responsibility for it. And then we, we learn from it, and that's when we move forward. And that takes us really to point number three, links so well. You want greater peace today? How do we resolve the yesterday? You may need to forgive yourself Absolutely. for what you did. Billy Graham's wife, Ruth Graham, asked for this to be engraved on her tombstone. It's such an amazing line. Let's have a look. It says, end of construction. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> We're That's all, a great one. We're all, absolutely, we're all a construction, aren't we? Sometimes with setbacks and detours mm -hmm. and equipment lying around, and it requires patience, and very often that requires patience with ourselves. Mm -hmm. You want to have greater peace today? Resolve yesterday by forgiving yourself for what you did yesterday. But maybe you're sitting here saying, Mark, you have no idea. You have no idea the mess that I've made. I, I can't forgive myself. It's just too big. And, and I remember reading up on this point, and I came across this rather shocking, surprising, but truthful statement from Focus on the Family. And they're highlighting, if you don't forgive yourself, it's the same as unbelief. And then they go and explain why. And have a look at these two beautiful verses from Paul. It says here, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It says in Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he's what? A new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So here's the logic. If you're not, not forgiving yourself, if, if you're holding yourself in bondage and condemnation, you don't believe that. It's as if you're trying to crucify Jesus Christ again. And that's what's highlighted in Hebrews chapter 6. You say, that sounds crazy. That sounds serious. It is serious. It's also almost as if you're saying, Jesus, God, what you did on the cross is not good enough. It's not good enough to cover what I've done. Mm. That's mm. like unbelief. Mm. And you need to realize, forgiving yourself, it's a process. Yeah. It's a process. Fari Tim Boom, a survivor of a Nazi concentration camp was really struggling with this whole thing of forgiveness. And she shares this beautiful story where an old priest takes her aside and brings her to a church bell and gets her to pull on that rope to get that church bell ringing. And as she's pulling, this priest says to her, let go of the rope. 
And as she lets go of the rope, he asks her, do you hear the bell ringing? And of course it's still ringing. It's still got momentum. It's still swaying. She says, yes, of course. He said, great, whatever you do, don't grab the rope again. Sure. And what was he highlighting? Mm -hmm. I'm highlighting that thing that you've done yesterday. That relapse, that moment of madness, that outburst, that affair, it's going to ring in your ears for some time. Whatever you do, don't yeah. grab the rope yeah. again. Yeah. Don't relive it. Don't keep saying, but if only, if only, don't punish yourself. You're under construction. Mm. Be patient. We just sang a line. You're not finished yet, mm. and when God is finished, you're going to be amazed. You want more peace today? You have to resolve yesterdays. And when I see that word resolve, I can't help but think of high school mathematics, which brings a chill to my spine, I must be <laughs> honest. But do you remember they give you this crazy equation and then say resolve X? You can't just stare at the exam paper hoping that X resolves itself and you get 100%. It doesn't work that way. You apply formulas. You take certain steps to resolve X, to resolve yesterday. And that's what we're doing. And I think it's exactly what we're doing here this morning. So I want to encourage you to have greater peace today. You've got to, you've got to resolve your yesterdays. And, and apply the, the simple formulas that we've given you now this morning, or I even want to say some, some God-given principles. So Amen. what are they? Let's quickly have a look at those three again. Number one, seek reconciliation. Is there somebody that you need to call? Is there a door that you need to knock on? Maybe a milk dot that you need to take, even, even if they take it and slam the door. What about evaluating failure? We all fail. Just because you fail doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. We all fail, but we don't all learn from our failure. So we've got to look back, learn from it, mo move forward. Look and learn. Mm. Look and learn, all right? Mm. And then how about the last one, forgiving self? For some people, I realize it's easy. For others, this may be a difficult one, but as Mark just pointed out, when we don't forgive ourselves, almost like we're saying to God, God, what you did on the cross wasn't quite good enough. So we need to come and say, God, you've forgiven me. Mm. Thank you so much. Amen. And obviously, I'm going to forgive myself. You apply these three basic principles, I'm telling you now, you'll have greater peace today. So, let's go back to that line that we started off right in the beginning. To increase your peace today, you've got to resolve your yesterdays. We've just done that, all right. And you've got to prepare for your tomorrows. But maybe you're sitting there saying, prepare? How do you prepare for a future tomorrow that is so uncertain? And doesn't the Bible say something about, you know, we, we make plans, but God determines our steps, so why bother? Well, that line is not about not doing preparation. Mm. It's about the fact God loves to do life with us. The Bible is full of the need and instruction for us to prepare. Let's just give you some. There's this great verse that we've used before, Proverbs 6, verse 6. Let's have a look. Such a great illustration. Look at an ant. Watch closely. Let it teach you a thing or two. Nobody has to tell it what to do. Here comes the preparation. All summer, it stores up food. At harvest, he stockpiles provision. There's another crazy, amazing verse in Proverbs. And what I find so interesting about this verse, it gets said twice, word for word, in two different places. So whether you want to read it in 22 or 27, let's have a look what it says. A prudent person sees trouble coming. A wise guy sees trouble coming. And what does he do? He ducks. That's planning, that's preparation. A simpleton, a moron, he walks on blindly, I love the Bible, and then says, and gets clobbered. Jesus' own words are, no one builds a tower without first counting the cost. Preparation is part of life. Preparation is part of being a human being, at least a wise human being. But how do we prepare for a tomorrow that is so uncertain? And I think that's a good question. So we're going to use a line that you've heard in the world before many times. It's negative and it's cynical, but we're going to turn it on mm. its head into something positive because even though it's negative and cynical, it's got some wisdom and we're going to tap into that. Maybe you've said this line yourself and here it goes. The only thing certain in life is death and taxes. taxes. 
Surely, that makes us think. Surely, we don't want to get clobbered. Surely, we ask ourselves, am I budgeting my money? Am I prioritizing family? Am I ready for eternity? I think those are some good preparation questions to ask, planning for tomorrow. So let's look at the first one, money. Money. It affects all of us. Just like we've all made mistakes, money affects all of us. Now you may be saying, whoa, 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 hang on. Hang on, hang on. More money is definitely not going to increase my joy or increase my happiness and you did right. It won't. It's not more money that increases our happiness. It's the wiser management of the money mm. that increases our peace or our management. So it's not the more, mm. it's the management. And that's why God's Word has so much to say on the whole topic of, of money. Do you know that this is one of the most addressed topics in the Bible? Money. And by Jesus Himself. Why? Because it affects us so much. So, here's the temptation that we all face in 2020. It's to live beyond our means. To go and buy that vehicle that, that, that we so desperately want. We don't really need it, but, but we want it. And, and it's too much, but, but we, go, we want to go and get it. Or to spend on our credit card and to think it's just somehow going to sort itself out down the line. Or to go out for dinner or movies with friends and you can't really afford it. Or how about Christmas gifts for children and now? Because, you know, I've got to give them that. I will try and keep up with the Joneses, you know. I saw, uh, I saw the Joneses at Macro the other day. Their card got declined, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> really? It's good to keep that in mind. <laughs> now, here's the problem with that kind of thinking or that kind of living. Living beyond our means you become a slave. You say, what do you mean become a slave? That's crazy. No, no, no. You're going to have a look at Scripture. That's exactly what Scripture uh, teaches us in Proverbs 22, verse 7. It says, the borrower is the slave to the lender. Now, what's the basic definition of a slave? Someone without freedom. Mm. So when you and I run into debt, when we start living beyond our means, we start spending money that we shouldn't really. You know what we're doing is we're slowly eroding our freedom. Our freedom to, to choose what we're going to buy, when we're going to buy. Because, because now you're strapped. You, you can't really. Uh, maybe our freedom to, to uh, allocate uh, money when we want to where we want to, because remember now, now Standard Bank and Net Bank and Edgar's and Woolies and all, they're standing in line for our money. And so it first goes to them, so we can't do that. And so we lose that freedom. And yes, yes, I think this is a sad one. We lose the freedom to help and to bless others because, because, because now we're strapped. We, we can't do that. Here's a thought I want you just to, just to ponder on. How sad we buy many things we don't really need, preventing us from helping others in desperate need. How sad we buy many things we don't really need. It'll be nice to have, but we don't really need it, and it prevents us helping others in desperate need. So that's just a quick thought we want to leave with you today. You want to have greater peace today, you've got to start preparing for tomorrow. And one of, the, one of the main ways that we do that is looking at our finances, is doing a little bit of budgeting, uh, and making sure that we don't live beyond our means, spending money that we don't have. So that brings us to the next point on preparing for tomorrow, and that's prioritizing family. Also a big one. Because you know the number one regret for individuals on their deathbeds yeah. is not spending enough time with family. And in the 21st century, time has become this precious commodity. There's this premium. And, and there are so many things calling us, screaming out for a piece of our schedules every single day. And we all face the temptation of sacrificing family time to try and yeah. meet th yeah. those vast appetites. Yeah. Of everything else. So I want to highlight something to you when it comes to life and how God 
has designed life. If you speak to an engineer, an architect, a builder, what is of utmost importance to that individual? Foundation. Foundation. They're going to tell you that bridge, that building is only as strong as the foundation. What is one of the foundations, the foundation stone to life here on earth? God has designed family. Think about it. A country, a society, a, a town is only as strong as its family. And we've got to prepare and prioritize time with family. Why? Because relationships are a function of time. How do children spell love? T-I-M-E. There's a very famous American pastor who's just recently retired. It was called to many conferences and speaking engagements. But he shares, this is one of the principles he has in life. At the start of a new year, he sits down with his diary and he schedules family time. Every other conference, every other invite or speaking engagement has to work around his family time. He it's, prepares. It's so true. And, and so often you and I have sat with couples going through a difficult time in their marriage. And, and one, of, one of the basic questions we'll ask them is, uh, how often do you spend time together? Oh, you know, every night, you know, we get home to the same home, you know. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not, that's not what I mean. How often do you spend quality time together? Yeah. When, when last did you go on a date night? And they kind of look at us as if we're Eskim announcing, you know, stage six load sheds or something, you know. <laughs> And when I get that look, I already know what they're thinking. I already know. We don't have time. You know, we, we, we just, we're too busy. We're too tired. And, and they come up with all these excuses because, you see, they, they don't realize this one important thing. You can't afford not to spend time if you want to grow stronger relationships. And so any strong relationship, friendship, family, marriage requires time. And so you've got to schedule it. You've got to plan it. You've got to, you've got to make time for it. Put in, put in the effort. So here's perhaps a challenge we'd like to give you. Take it up or don't. It's up to you because we want to increase your peace today, which means planning for tomorrow. So how about you and your wife sit down and look at your diary for 2020 and you plan a date night once a month going into that year. Just and, a and once a month. You don't, you're, if you want to do it once a week, I'm sure she won't mind. <laughs> but once a month, guys, don't, you know, don't stress yourself too much. But how about, how about this? If, if you have children at home, little children at home, plan now already. Plan an outing sometime with the children. Something that you wouldn't normally do. Something different. Because think about it. It's the different that they remember. How about perhaps as an extended family scheduling a bride together before the summer's over? Or seeing them talking about food. How about, uh, if, again, if you've got children, let them prepare breakfast. It is dangerous. I just want to give you a heads up. <laughs> Last time I did that, our children were small and, and we got a couple of uh, slices of cucumber and three Cocoa Pops. What's wrong with that? That's my breakfast. <laughs> That's why you look the way you do. <laughs> okay. Why not sit down as a couple and prepare that holiday, plan that holiday for 2020, and it doesn't have to be elaborate, it doesn't have to be expensive. How about going camping? Kids love it. The point is, greater peace today comes from peace in the home, which comes from prioritizing, plan, planning family time. All right, good. So here's the last one quickly, eternity. Now, I know this is a topic we don't always like to think about, talk about eternity and death and so on. And, and, and we just assume that we'll all be back here next week, next month, next year. We just assume that. But the reality is there's somebody sitting in this auditorium today, and I, I found in a group this size, there's a very good chance that one of us will not be here next year. And you will wake up in tomorrow and discover it's not a normal tomorrow, it's eternity. Yeah. That's what happens, and, and, and we've got to be ready for that, because we're going to face that. Jesus told a number of stories highlighting the silliness of not preparing for eternity, and, 
and just thinking of everything on earth here and just being so busy and so caught up with all of this that you forget about that. So he tells the story of this rich farmer, plants crops and builds barns and everything. So in other words, he's doing really well, yeah, but he forgets about there, about eternity. And his eternity, Jesus tells, would come that very next day tomorrow for him. Mm -hmm. Jesus tells another story of these ten bridesmaids. And they're waiting for the groom. And the groom represents eternity. And so five of the bridesmaids are ready. They, they, they're ready for the groom. And when the groom came, they're ready. But the other five, no, they're still out shopping. They in East Rand Mall, they're busy there. <laughs> and, and so they, they totally miss the groom. They miss eternity. And so what is his point there? He says, you've got to be mindful of eternity. Don't get so caught up here and so busy here and so focused here that you forget about there. Colossians 3 verse 2 says, it tells us, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. What does that mean? Does, does that mean that we become so heavenly minded that we know earthly good? No, not at all. It also doesn't mean that we become these super spiritual space cadets, strange kind of people. You've met them and, and you just think, man, you just, you're just weird. That's not what it's referring to. I think the key word here is set. Set your mind on things above. What does it mean to set something? Uh, you can set your watch. You can set the, the time on your watch. Or you can set an alarm. Or you can set an appointment in, in, in your diary. And what happens when you do that? That, that thing, that, that, that watch becomes your, your guide. It guides you throughout the day to, to, to stick to that time. Or if you set an alarm, for instance... It becomes your guide when to start something or when to stop something. You set an appointment. It becomes your guide. When do I need to be there? What day? It becomes your guide. Now, when the Bible says, set your mind on things above, you know what it's saying is let the, 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 the uh, reality of eternity, of heaven, let it become your guide. It doesn't say forget about everything on earth and and just, you know, just become crazy, spooky, spiritual. No. It says, do everything that you do with that in mind. Yeah. All your thinking and your planning and your dreaming and your scheming, all of that, that's fine. But do it with that in mind. Let that become your God. And you know what I found? You have heaven in mind, you live with that as your guide, all your decisions and everything, wow, you have a peace like you've never had before. Absolutely. That's why Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, and you've heard that before, for me to live is Christ. What is he saying? I've got an eternity mm. mindset. I, that's how I'm thinking. And to die is gain. And he's just highlighting, I'm not afraid. I'm not petrified. In fact, I've got peace. I'm, in, I'm excited about that tomorrow, which mm. is coming, where I wake up on the other side of the grave. Yeah, he's saying, I'm looking forward to it. So, let's wrap this up. Let's go back to that line that we looked at right in the beginning. To increase your peace today, you've got to resolve your yesterday. In other words, you've got to deal with a couple of stuff but you've got to prepare for your tomorrows. All right. Now, I know we've just touched on these things, just six things. It's almost like when, when you throw a, a stone across the water and it just skims across the water. That's kind of what we've done this morning. We've just touched on a couple of these things. But here's the question, and here's the, what I want you to do. Which one of these six applies to you? That's what I want you to walk out with you this morning. And so let's quickly go back and let's go and have a look at those six on the screen quickly. Here's the first one there. Seek reconciliation. Is that you? Is there a phone call you need to make? Is there a door that you need to knock on? Is there a milk tart you need to take? All right, be ready if they take it and slam the door in your face. All right, then the next one. What about evaluating failure? We all fail, man. You know, stop knocking yourself over the head and, oh, man, I was so stupid. We all fail. 
But we've got to look and learn. Look and learn. And then here's the next one. Forgiving self. God forgives us. We've got to take that forgiveness. Because that frees us. That gives us peace. And then what about the next one down there? Budgeting your money. We've got a course coming up beginning of next year. A finance course where we'll teach you to budget. If you don't know, you're just not sure, make sure that you enroll for that early next year. We'll have that, that uh, finance course and then prioritizing family. Is that your one? Because there's, there's nothing else. Let me tell you, it's like Mark said. And we, we deal with this. I don't want to say all the time, but regularly, people on their deathbed, they say, man, the car, the, the this, the, that stuff wasn't important. Family. Let's get it right now. What about that last one? Consider eternity. If you're here this morning and you're saying, well, I, 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 I haven't made right with God. I, you know, I've been, I've been attending church a little bit and I've been kind of looking in from the outside but I'm not there yet. I want to give you an, a, an opportunity this morning to get there. What does that mean? That you simply surrender your life to God, that you come to Him and you say, God, I, I surrender my life. I, I ask you to become my Lord and Savior. There, there's no formula. You don't have to do this and that and the next. Thing. There's no formula. God sees our hearts. And so when we come to Him and we surrender, we say, God, I surrender to you. You become born again. And the moment you become born again, I'm telling you, that's where you put your head in the pillow at night and you have peace like you've never had before. So I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. And I want to pray for us. Can we bow our heads? And the first prayer I'm going to pray is for those of you who've never surrendered your life to Jesus. And maybe you want to do that. And if you want to, then just quietly in your heart, just pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you today. I'm a sinner and I've messed up so badly for so long. And I'm asking your forgiveness. I receive it today. I'm a new creation. We just looked at that that verse this morning, all things have passed away. Behold, I've become new. And that's what's happening right now. And so thank you that I can be your child. Thank you that from today, I belong to you. And if you've prayed that prayer, we believe that you've become born again, that you've become a son and a daughter of God. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for these very simple, very basic lessons. And God, I pray for each one of us, whichever one it is that we need to apply, I pray that we won't just be hearers of the word, but do us. And we'll go out of this place today and apply just one of these basic things in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you.